Hey, what's up, people? This is Greg, a.k.a. Crazy G from Crazy G in the G Spot and NECR New England Concert Reviews. Today, I have a very special guest, and uh, he is a Grammy-nominated blues musician, and he is none other than Mr. James Montgomery from the James Montgomery Band. Hello, welcome, and thanks for taking the time to talk to us here at NECR. How are you? Yeah, hey, listen, I'm, I'm doing great, and uh, I, I should be thanking you for having me on your show. It's, um, you know, blues like, you know, 2% of the marketplace or whatever, so we need all the help we can get, and we really appreciate it, but um, things are going really well. The band is uh, on fire right now. We're, we're doing our usual summer New England tour, so, uh, but, and we just been playing great, doing great crowds, and, and uh, we also are just finished working on a new studio record, so there's a lot of stuff going on, and uh, we're really excited about it. Well, that's awesome. I think we'll uh, touch upon a couple of those things that uh, I actually caught. I want to start off by saying James Montgomery is legendary in the genre of blues. You've tackled it with vigor and great success. What has it been like for you through the years and what was the story behind you actually going into the blues? Well, you know, I had a, uh, a radio show for a while and um, I, I interviewed over 110 blues artists and every, every one of them except for maybe two has a moment that they remember that the moment that they got into blues. Uh, you know, with rock and roll people, it's different, you know, they and they said, I wanted to play guitar, or I liked rock and roll, or I liked this band or that band. I wanted to wear beetle boots, or I wanted to get girls, or whatever it is. But blues musicians would all have a moment, and that moment came for me when I was 15 or 16 years old, and I saw a live blues harmonica for the first time. And something just clicked inside of me, and I said, you know, that, that's what I want to do. It, 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 it's, just, um, it's just such an emotional and visceral uh, moment, and that's been Aristotelian in a way, in terms of uh, once you start playing, you get that cathartic principle going with. So, you know, blues musicians, we have something that hit this strikes us pretty deeply and, and uh, moves us in that direction. Of course, I was going up to Detroit then, so, which was great because there were so many different blues clubs up and running back then. You know, John Lee Hooker, well, of course, he lived in Detroit then, but John Lee would be in one room and then Muddy would be playing in another room and the little Sonny a Detroit guy would be playing Johnny Bass, another Detroit guy, but, you know, Buddy Guy and Junior Walls and Muddy Waters and John Lee Hooker might have all been in the same town on the same night, so it was a really healthy scene back then. That That's pretty amazing stuff right there, let me tell you. Uh, yeah, and in those days, you know, you could just walk into Muddy's room and say hello, or you could walk into Buddy and Junior's room and say hello. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, now when I tour with Buddy Guy, they have to go through three lines of security just to say hello to a guy that I've known since I was 16, and, and he used to have our, my band back him up when he came to Boston, and sometimes he'd put the band up at my apartment so he could save money. But, you know, so it was a great time to grow up, a lot of um, a lot of places to, to listen to music, and, and, and you know, like I say, it, it was just so casual, you know, but he, it, it, James Cotton and I became really good friends, and, and same with Junior Wells, uh, because you could just walk in the dressing room and start hanging, you know, and, uh, and you know, to this day, uh, James Cotton now calls me son, and I call him dad, you know, and I call him out, of course, your dad wants to say hello, so, <laughs> so it was a great time to grow up, and, um, you know, great time to get hit by the blues, because there was so so much of it going around, and, and uh, all of the best players in the world. I almost felt like I was right back there with you for a second. <laughs> I, yeah, no, it, it, it was, uh, it, I say, it was, uh, everybody was loose, everybody, you know, right around the time of the hippie era too you know so everybody was trying to be you know it was all about us and it was all about you know love peace and understanding and all that stuff and it really was so everyone was really um no, nobody worried too much about anything back then everything you didn't have to have security you know you, right, you, you, right. It, was, it wasn't needed we could use a little that today but we won't even go there <laughs> no no that'll be a six hour interview there, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly <laughs> Your hop playing is world renowned. You created so much, played with so many, and you continue to shine. What would you say has helped your success more than anything else, and what can you contribute your longevity to? Well, you know, it's, it's almost cliche in a way, you know, the, the passion for, uh, yeah, for what I do is really what keeps me going. Um, and the, the other thing is, uh, I've always hired and surrounded myself with the best musicians in the business. Every one of my bands has had just killer players and you know, the, and including the band I have now, where I, I really 
we can have one of the best blues bands in the country. But, you know, we, we, we play blues differently than uh, a lot of the uh, blues society bands. We, we model ourselves up after James Cotton and Paul Butterfield, so we're kind of more high energy. But every time we hit the stage, we have a ball. It's impossible for us to have a bad night. So, you know, it was the passion, the love of this music uh, that got me into it and kept me going. And also the fact that I've always had great players and great bands and, and every night that we're on stage, it's just, um, it's a fantastic experience to, to be on stage with, with, with the bands that I've had. So, um, and because of that, if you have a great band, you're going to relate really well to the audience. And, you know, more than half the battle at this point, it's impossible for us to have a bad night. So what makes one night better for us than, than another night is the audience. So all that stuff, you know, that keeps you going and keeps you on top of your game. The other thing is I've, I've never wanted to put blues in a box. You know, I've always wanted to see all the different permutations that come out of that form. So that's why in our band, you know, we play some straight ahead blues, but other kind of rock blues and then New Orleans style blues and even some jazzy stuff here and there. And, and of course, growing up in Detroit, I'm a huge fan of funk music as well. So we try to make some of our blues funky as well. Cool. You have played with so many artists that I couldn't even begin to name them all. It has been a, a, a great ride. There's hardly anybody that, that I haven't played with that I wanted to. You know, when I was a kid, learning how to play, and um, you know, I built a washtub bass, and I and I built a harmonica rack, and I would play in the basement with a washtub bass and a and a harmonica, and I would you know think about Muddy Waters and BB King and John Lee Hooker and the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and things. And eventually, I ended up playing with all of them. So and plus, um, you know. All, all the great bands I toured with in the Capricorn days, you know, Bruce Springsteen, the Allman Brothers, and uh, Leonard Skinner, Marshall Tucker, you know, the list goes on and on. But it's true, I've played with just about everybody, including the Ramones and the uh, Dead Boys and, uh, and that stuff, so I, I like that kind of music as well. That That is pretty cool, I gotta say, the Ramones, yeah. yeah every Ramones record release party in Boston happened in my apartment. That's even more cool, wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, well my my brother was uh, vice president of Sire Records at the time, and uh, they, they were his band, one of, the, one of the bands he was in charge of promoting, so I got to know those guys really well. And um, I love that band, and uh, one of these days I'm going to do a, a blues cover of I Want to Be Sedated. So <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just warning you, I'm warning the listeners right now, my, a James Montgomery version of I Want to Be Sedated is in the works. <laughs> hey, listen, I, I would love to hear a blues version of that. I think that would yeah, be pretty... I'm, 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 closer, I'm closer releasing it, so uh, anyway. Well, who would you say out of all these artists that you've met throughout your career, who would you say has made more of an impact on you through your career? Well, you know, the guys, my hands-on teachers, the guys who, like, really, really were hands-on with me were Junior Wells and, and uh, James Cotton. You know, they showed me stuff and taught me stuff and everything. And, uh, and John Lee Hooker, you know, was a, a close friend. But, you know, he was a guitar player. But, uh, you know, what? he was great to play with because he never, um, he hardly ever played the same song the same way twice. <laughs> so you had to really listen up and see where he was going, you know. And then, and then when I sat with Honey Boy Edwards, it was even like, you got to be kidding me because you really had to listen to Honey Boy to see where he was going to go. But um, so the, the, the guys who've had the most influence on me, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've always modeled my band somewhere between early James Cotton bands when he just left Muddy Waters, when he had uh, the Matt Murphy on guitar and uh, Bobby Wild Dog Anderson on bass and um, Sam Lay on drums and, and uh, Luther it'll come to me but anyway but that really high energy band with Killer or, or Kenny Johnson on drums and then Paul Butterfield you know was the energy and in Paul's case the different avenues that he explored and where he took the blues it was um, it, you know that's another thing that, that was really influential on me and one of the reasons why I don't like to play blues like and keep it in a strict 12 bar box I like to take blues and see where it goes organically on its own did you ever get a chance to do any work with Stevie Ray Vaughan I never did um, 
I've done a bunch of stuff with Jimmy Warren, but uh, I've never, never worked with Stevie Ray. I saw him play once at the Channel in Boston, and he was fantastic. But I, I, usually in those days, I would end up meeting people and hanging out with them. There must have been something else going on that night, because I don't remember staying afterwards to say hello to Stevie Ray. But, but uh, you know, we do a thing in my set where um, my guitar player, George McCann, is like, you know, the best in the business. Uh, I throw names at him and ask him to play in that style, and one of the names I threw at him one night was Stevie Ray Vaughan, and, you know, he proceeded to play just like Stevie Ray Vaughan. It probably got one of the, the biggest applause of the night. I mean, that's how, you know, I, I, I understand how extremely popular Stevie Ray was and the a huge, huge um, part he played in bringing blues to a whole other generation of people. Tremendous respect for him. Yeah, he definitely did. You are in the process right now of doing a documentary called Man in Blue. What can you tell us about this briefly, and what made you decide to do this? Well, you know, to be honest with you, I'm kind of involved in that project, kicking and screaming. It's a, they're making a movie about me, and, and I'm, I, to be honest with you, I wanted somebody to make a movie about me, you know. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm making a documentary on James Cotton, which I'm, uh, which we started, and also I'm in a documentary about Paul Barfield. Uh, they flew me out to Chicago with Bonnie Wade and um, Maria Muldar and Alvin Bishop and um, Al Cooper, a bunch of people. I'm actually involved in three documentaries right now, and, and I'm making a documentary documentary about my younger brother, but that's a whole different subject. But the musical documentaries I'm involved in now are the Paul Butterfield one, the um, the one that I'm making about James Cotton, and they're, they're making one about me. And like I said, I'm, I'm going to have to start paying attention to that just so I, because it's happening. I, you know, it wasn't my idea, um, but you know, I'm supposed to be doing some shooting with Stephen Tyler coming up in a week or two, and then I've done some shooting with a very good role from Boston, and I spent a, a day on Martha's Vineyard with Kate Taylor and reminisced about all the times we, we spent out there with James Taylor and Kate Taylor and Alex Taylor and that whole family that really is a is a family that became really close to, to me. You know, so in that in that regard, you know, the, the documentary they're making about me has been fun because you know they keep hooking hooking me up with people that, that I get to spend a day with, and, and it's always an old friend. You know, I'm looking forward to spending a day with Stephen Tyler because we go back an awful long way. You created so many favorites in your career. What songs would you say hit home more than any other, and why? Well, I, you know, I, I'd say the song that I didn't write, but that I rearranged dramatically, is a song that uh, we just call the train. It's uh, my version of uh, Mystery Train. You know, the, you know, that the Paul Butterfield played, Muddy Waters played it, and uh, I think Elvis even did a version of it. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Um, but that song, it was a big hit for me, and it was the number one song played on DCN for a little bit. And and you know, I played it for like 20 years, and then stopped playing it for 15 years. And then but I got so many requests for it that one night I just told the guys before the encore I said you know are you guys familiar with that train song at all and they, they said well we're doing it right now yeah. <laughs> I went out on stage and I directed them through the song and when it goes from the boogie beat to the supple it's such a release and it was so, so great it was like all of a sudden it all came back to me as to why that song was so popular so, so that song and uh, New England Sunshine I think are the other ones that I identify with most yeah it's funny you mentioned BCN because the other day I was going through some old stuff and I just happened to find about 20 WBCN bumper stickers. I'm like, where did these come from? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, you might be able to get like 50 bucks a piece of those. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I'd set up a merch table at the next concert I went to. <laughs> you do so much around the state of Mass and the Cape. You have shows coming up all over the place. What show or shows are you looking forward to and why? Well, you know, and this is going to sound horny or try to rehearse or anything, but I, I really look forward to every show that we do, uh, and, and I really do mean that. Specifically, coming up, let me grab my book here, because um, I know there's, there's a festival in Spencer, Mass, that they're they're really trying to, it's only their second year, and they're trying to trying to really make a go of it, and the people there are just really, really, really nice people, and, they, and I, I really want that festival to be successful, so that's at Franklin, Mass. I mean, that's at Spencer, Mass, on the 5th of August and then the, the night before that I'm at the Black Box which is a great new place in Franklin, Massachusetts I've got another thing at the, on the 12th at the Naval Base in Weymouth on the 13th uh, there's another festival that'll be my first festival that I'm playing called the Dragonfly Festival in Ashland so there's a bunch of them coming up you know and um, of course I do that Thursday the 18th at the Harbor House in Boston and that's just the most beautiful 
Bellevue and the Harbor and everything. So I got a date with Room for the Blues coming up on the 20th of August. And then, so I, I'm going to be all over, but then, and I'm going to be in Massachusetts quite a bit. Um, Franklin on the 5th, Spencer on the 6th, and then Weymouth on the 12th, and Ashland on the 13th. That's my neck of the woods, Spencer. So, yeah, it's a. Oh, good. Well, you got to come up to that because it's, um, the people who put it on are just really great. They're really great to work with. And it's only their second year, and they're trying to really uh, get it off the ground so they can continue to do it. Yeah, that sounds like a fantastic idea. How do you feel about the moniker of Grammy nominated, and what would you like to say to those who have put you there? Well, you know, I've been on the nominating ballot for, for a Grammy uh, on my own. My actual Grammy nomination was for a um, record that I did with Johnny Winter. And, uh, but, you know, I was in Johnny's man for five or six years, and he was like, that's the most unique person I've ever met in my life. <laughs> and um, everybody who knew Johnny loved him. So that's when I got my Grammy nomination was, was for the work that I did, which I, I had some songs on that on that um, CD. You know, so the nomination was for Johnny, but had the had he won that year, uh, I would have gotten a Grammy award for it. So uh, the other times I've been nominated for a Grammy, I've been on the on the Grammy nominating ballot, which is just one step away from the first to being nominated. I got two more questions for you, and then I'll let you go. You have covered many songs from many incredible artists. I would like to know what the process is like to do a cover for a harpist like yourself. Where would you begin with the various styles? And I gotta say, it, it's gotta be pretty tough for s some of the covers that you've done. Well, you know, a lot of times, um, I, almost, I'd say about 80% of the time if I cover a song, I'm going to change the arrangement. Uh, just because if I cover a song, it's because I think it's a really great song to cover. And if I think it's a really great song to cover, then I'm probably thinking also, you know, maybe I'm not going to do it better than the guy who did it in the first place. <laughs> you know, we're doing a Fall by the Field record right now. We just finished it in the studio. It's dedicated to Paul. But we're covering seven of his songs on there. And some of them, uh, those are the feeling, for instance, we're doing it just the way Paul did it. And that's challenging because I really tried to, um, really tried to play the harmonica solo, you know, not to not know like Paul, but, here, but play it so that if someone listened to it and they knew, knew Paul's playing, they, they would go out, you know, that, that's really in the style that Paul played in. And then other songs like One More Heartache, which Paul goes, boom, 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 does a, a, a jumpy little bass line that. It's a really cool version. But I, I I rearrange that to make it sound like a James Bond song. So, so yeah, so that's, I, I like to have fun when, if I cover something. When we covered Hit the Road Jack, we did it like Donnie Hathaway. We did it, a, a jazz version of it. We changed the chorus around and stuff like that. You know, so if I do cover something, we try and make it our own. I would think for a harpist to, the, you know, like you said, you got to change the arrangement. And I would kind of think it'd be a little more difficult than, say, going from, you know, an electric version to an acoustic acoustic version, you know what I'm saying? So that's very interesting. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. And then we did uh, get a record with James Cotton, and we took some of the old acoustic stuff and made electric versions of them, which was also a lot of fun. It was challenging to do this Butterfield thing because he was such a monster player and played with such energy and authority, and I really tried to get that across on the record. Finally, I would like to ask if there is anything else in store for James Montgomery and the James Montgomery Band in the future we might not know about. About. Well, just the uh, the Paul Butterfield CD because that that isn't even out yet. Um, you know, it's uh, hopefully in production right now. So that that's coming out. And uh, again, we already touched on the documentaries, um, the Paul Butterfield documentary. I think it's coming out like you know any day now. And then um, movie they're making on me, The Man in Blue or whatever it is. Um, you know, I mean, I, even I don't know what's going to happen with that. So um, I'll be as uh, intrigued as anyone to see how that turns out. So far, it's been great. On putting it together. That's amazing, and I want to thank you for your contribution to the blues as well, because I'll tell you, although my specialty is heavy metal, I like all music. I was brought up on quite a bit of it, the old country western, the old blues, and there's so many great genres out there, including the blues, that, you know, at a young age, I absorbed myself into a lot of it. And, and you know, frankly, you know, heavy 
level is kind of like uh, a permutation of blues anyway. So, you know, it's a, just another another form of music that blues became that traced the roots of heavy metal back. You'll find that it traces back to electric blues. Yeah, I, I heard that before somewhere. I can't recall where, but yeah, I can remember. I don't know if I read it uh, somewhere or what, but I, I remember that. So get that metal heads out there. <laughs> Yeah, it, it yeah, can all yeah. be traced. I, I guess the heaviest, the, 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 the most metal bands that I toured with would, would have been Deep Purple and, and, uh, and Mitchie Blythe, of course. Like, they, they were a great band to play with. Mr. James Montgomery, I thank you once again for talking to us here at NECR. I wish you the best in the future for you, the band, your shows, everything you do, Man in Blue. Keep pumping out the blues, man, because I'll tell you, it's a great genre, and uh, I think more people should try to explore it, you know. As I mentioned earlier, Stevie Ray Vaughan, I, I listened to him when I was a kid, and, you know, great. Even Hendrix. I mean, Hendrix has got some blues in there, too, and Zeppelin. Oh, uh, no, yeah, he's a stone-cold blues player. I mean, you know, Voodoo Child and all that stuff, you know. He's, um, you know, he was a heavily influenced by Buddy Guy, you know, you know, but when I used to tour with Buddy Guy and they'd say, some of your playing reminds me of Jimi Hendrix and, you know, were you influenced by him? Buddy Guy would actually feel insulted because, you know, I, I've seen pictures and there's of, of Hendrix sitting in the front row with Buddy Guy shows trying to learn as much as he could from Buddy. Wow. So, you know, all that stuff goes back to, to blues. No, and that, that's, hey, I have no problem with that, let me tell you. Again? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we'll see you in Spencer. That'll be a come, come back stage. I'll have a bottle of wine for you back there. All right, sounds good. I'll definitely take you up on that. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. James Montgomery from the James Montgomery Band. Once again, thank you. Have a good one. And, thank you. Uh, the best to you. Okay, thanks, buddy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That was Mr. James Montgomery from the James Montgomery Band. And, uh, yeah, that was a pretty cool interview. Uh, pretty interesting to hear how the blues made a major impact on heavy metal. So that's going to wrap it up for this one. I am Greg, a.k.a. Crazy G from Crazy G in the G Spot and NECR New England Concert Reviews. I'll be back soon. Later.